This is something we're going to start doing in the few short moments before each episode. As you know, we avoid chit-chat on this podcast, and we try to make the most of every minute of your listening time. Still, a lot of listeners have been asking us for certain updates and information as part of the episode so they don't have to look it up online. With that in mind, the only order of business this time around is to learn more about you, the kinds of episodes you like, the kinds of guests you like, and your favorite topics. Send them to me through email at tim at shapingopinion.com. We'll keep you informed in future episodes and may give you a shout out if you want. And please know how truly grateful we are that you have become a regular listener of the Shaping Opinion podcast. You're the reason we do this. This is Shaping Opinion, a production of O'Brien Communications. If they could have made a music video, is there any band from history that you would like to have seen made a music video? Huh. Um, you know, they, they, I don't have anyone in mind, but I would say that the, the ones that made... In the early days of MTV, there were essentially two types of bands. There were the hams, who would, you know, who who were just kind of like essentially dying for the chance to make over-the-top music videos, and then there were the people who just felt like they shouldn't be caught dead making a music video, who were just felt it was beneath them, and you know, kind of having to lip sync or act in front of a camera diluted their artistry. And in a way, both both camps made equally fun videos. You know, in the, in the latter camp, if you watch early videos by Journey, for instance, you'll see a band that just like really just doesn't know how to behave in front of a camera, and and doesn't particularly want to be there. And then on the other hand, you have groups like you know Duran Duran, let's say, or a Flock of Seagulls, early '80s, you know, new wave bands, both English, who love the theatrics of music videos. So I don't have a ready answer to the question, but I would say any any of the groups from the you know the fifties or sixties or early seventies. I mean, I suppose in a way that you know, if Queen, well, although they made music videos, if they in their prime had had MTV as an outlet, I think they would have probably you know owned owned the network in those days. I'm Tim O'Brien. In this episode of the Shaping Opinion Podcast, we're joined by Craig Marks. He's the music editor of the Los Angeles Times and a co-author of the book, I Want My MTV, The Uncensored Story of the Music Video Revolution. Craig's co-author was Rob Tannenbaum. The premise of our podcast is simple. We talk about people, events, and things that have shaped the way we think. Today, we'll talk with Craig about the day the music took over your TV, the birth of MTV, music television. The date was August 1st, 1981, otherwise known as 8181. That was the night music television was launched. Fittingly, the first video viewers would see was called Video Killed the Radio Star. It was a two-year-old song by the Buggles that said it all. Before music television, radio and the record companies controlled the music industry. They decided what you would hear and who you would hear. They decided who the stars would be. After MTV, a lot more people had a say, and the music industry would never be the same. It didn't take long for MTV to have an impact. But before all of that could happen, the stars had to convince cable companies to carry the channel. That mission inspired the first iconic images of MTV. When David Bowie, Sting, and the police and others starred in TV spots, demanding, I want my MTV! I want my MTV! I want my MTV! Call your cable company and say, I want my MTV! Those spots drove demand on the part of young baby boomers in the first cohort of Generation X. The cable television companies responded. But before you can fully appreciate the impact MTV had on culture, it's important to know what it was like before music television. Craig Marks. Well, it was in the, in the 1970s. Uh, the record business was in very good shape, although it, it had just suffered the kind of disco bust. So after they invested all their money in disco music in the late 70s, that quickly became a fad and they were stuck with a lot of leftover disco cutouts and bands that they didn't know what to do with. So 
It, it was kind of an in-between phase in the music industry in the late 1970s and very early 1980s. You know, it, it was still at least another 10 years till CDs became the dominant medium for music, and that's, that was a big boom time for the record industry. So to ask you a question from a business level, the record business kind of needed a kickstart in 1981 when MTV first went on the air. And, uh, you know, one of the great regrets of the record companies and the record business back then and, and still to this day is that they gave MTV their, their music videos for free. Much like nowadays, uh, you know, Facebook, you know, they get all their content essentially for free. MTV got all their music videos for free. And I think one of the reasons that the record business was so willing to do that was because they, well, A, obviously they didn't really know what MTV would become. But B, they were in a position where they really needed to just try anything to, to jumpstart their business. And while it did jumpstart their business and MTV really helped artists and the music industry make, make millions and millions of dollars, the, the, the record business itself felt like they kind of gave away the, the key to the store by allowing MTV to build a huge network that was you know, infinitely more valuable than the record companies themselves based on their product you know, at, at no cost. Well, that kind of sets the stage. But Craig, before we get into the great detail that I want to get into on this topic, I did want to find out, how did you become a music writer and make this your life's work? Um, I, in college, wrote for my college newspaper and became a, involved in my college radio station. And from there, just kind of entered the music world, both through uh, writing and editing and also working a little bit in the industry. And then, you know, uh, at, in the early 90s, I was offered the job as the music editor of Spin Magazine, which was the prime competitor to Rolling Stone, even though it was, it was still pretty early days for the magazine, and started at the started at Spin the same month that Nirvana's Nevermind album came out, which obviously was a big, important record for lots of reasons. And, and from there, I've been a journalist and a music editor for my career. And you've done that in addition to writing a book now that is the center of our discussion today. And the book that you wrote was called I Want My MTV, The Uncensored Story of the Music Video Revolution, which came out on the 30th anniversary of MTV. And MTV was launched in 1981. What made you decide to write the book? Well, to be honest, it was, the, the idea came from the, the book's editor at the, at, the, at the publishing company. And then I was contacted because I had had experience as a, as a music journalist and, and also was you know, knew, knew both the music business and also knew the culture of music and enjoyed the, the kind of the commercial aspects uh, and the mass appeal of MTV. And so then the question is whether, you know, how we were going to write the book and we decided to do it as an oral history, which for people not familiar meant that it's almost like a documentary where we just interviewed, in this case, you know, 400 different or 450 different people, artists or executives, the founders of the network, directors, uh, fans of the net, you know, famous fans of the network, and kind of stitched it all together into this kind of rolling tapestry of eyewitness accounts of what it was like from 1979 when the idea first uh, came to John Lack, who was really the founder of the company. And we ended the book in approximately in 1992 when the real world, the uh, the first kind of reality TV show went on the air and we felt that that kind of marked the end of an of a particular era for music videos. So the book tells a story not just of the startup of the company MTV on the channel but also of the birth and this kind of golden age of music videos. Well, you mentioned who you talked to, 400 people. That's a daunting task just to put all that together, but I I think from what I can tell, there are some key players that you focused on, and I wanted to find out a little bit more about them, and they are the founders. John Lack, you mentioned, is the founder and the creator of MTV. Bob Pittman, John Sykes, Les Garland, Fred Siebert, and a few others. Uh, can you t tell us a little bit about each of them? Uh, John Lack. Sure. How did the idea come to, to John Lack? Uh, John, well, you know, John's an interesting character study because he, you know, he doesn't really get enough credit for, it was his idea. There's just no doubt. And no one really argues with that. Now, having the idea and then executing it and turning it into what it became are two different things, but it was clearly his idea. He was, um, he was a cable executive who, this is, you know, well before CNN went on the air, 
uh, even. He was in Europe where they showed what were kind of prototypes almost, early, early day music videos on different countdown shows there. And he thought that it would be a great idea to try that here in the U.S. They had already, he had already put on a couple of, he, he ran a movie channel and, uh, and another channel for a very pr- early prototype cable network. But he thought that there was a market for not just these music videos, but that if he could engage a teen market, that there'd be an advertisers, uh, it'd be an advertising friendly demographic. So he was an old rock and roll fan. He went to shows in the 1950s, doo-wop shows. He was, for among the people that you mentioned, he was considered old. I think he might have been 30 at the time when MTV started. Uh, one of his first hires was Bob Pittman, who was a very young kind of wonderkind in the, in the radio industry. And I think Bob was 24. And Bob was um, his number two. And Bob essentially usurped John's power and replaced John at the top of the network pretty early on in the network's history, maybe in 83 or so. So, uh, which, you know, became a kind of controversial um, aspect, whether Bob uh, pushed John out, and that kind of still is a, uh, an open-ended question. But Bob was very, Bob's a brilliant guy. He now runs iHeartMedia, which is one of the world's biggest uh, radio and, and media companies. He ran AOL for a while. He's very sharp. But he, he, he was a radio, you know, at the age of, he flies his own planes, he owns a tequila company. You know, he's a kind of bon vivant. But, you know, early on, he, he was a wonderkin radio programmer. And a lot of the MTV people in those early days came out of radio. That was a natural pathway. If you, you might have been a, you know, a, a big programmer at an FM radio station and programming music videos, it seemed, was similar to programming music at a radio station. So that's how they found a lot of their, their executive talent. Um, John Sykes, this was his first job. John Sykes came out of Syracuse University, uh, became most famous at MTV for creating a lot of the famous promotional spots and contests that the network ran. You know, in the early days, they would run contests like, you know, they would engage artists to run contests like John Mellencamp. You know, you can paint John Mellencamp's house. You can, you can have a party in, in Van Halen's backyard, things like that. That was John's ballywick. Uh, Les Garland was the most colorful person at the company. He was really the promo guy, promo guy, which meant that he came out of the music industry as doing p- uh, promotion for, to radio for a lot of kind of rock bands. His job at MTV was really artist relations. So mo- very famously in MTV's history, they were in the, in the very early days, it was touch and go whether they would make it or not. They were not having luck getting a lot of cable operators to carry their network. So he was in, there was a, an ad campaign that, that our book is named after, I Want My MTV, where it wasn't his idea, the campaign, but he was the one in charge of getting artists uh, like Mick Jagger and David Bowie and others to do essentially television spots, commercials, advertisements for MTV to go on uh, MTV and run these spots where, they, where David Bowie would say, I want my MTV, call your cable operator and tell them to carry MTV. And that was his that was his doing. It was his relations, his schmoozing with these artists that enabled that campaign to be so successful. One of the interesting things though in your book about that is that Les Garland was able to convince these iconic people like Mick Jagger to do this for free. And you said that I liked the way you described it, that because Les Garland and other people from MTV partied with these people and got to know them personally and had relationships with them. There was a level of trust there. And these people from MTV would party until 3 a.m. and be back at their desk at 9 a.m. But they were able to convince these people based on their relationships with Mick Jagger and Pete Townsend and others to do these free commercials for them. Yes, I mean, and you know, I'm sure if, if a similar company approached artists of that stature now, there's absolutely no chance in hell that they would be able to, that the artists would, you know, essentially do free adverts for, the, for anything. Um, but these were earlier, you know, more, I guess, more innocent times. And, and the MTV staff was very, uh, they were like a mullet. They were, you know, business in the front and party in the back. So, you know, they, you know, part, part of their job was fostering these relationships in order to make sure that artists 
came to MTV first and foremost when they had a new record, when they had a new video, when they had a new project, when they needed a favor. And, you know, and plus they were all young, too. The the executives at MTV were, you know, were all in their mid-20s at latest. And it was just natural for them. And they were in New York City at what was essentially a scrappy startup. And so, you know, partying with rock stars was not just a, a fringe benefit of the job. It, it In some ways, it was the job. Well, you talk to other people as well. You talk to several artists and you've talked to several music video directors Russell McKay or Russell McKay, as you described, you talk to him, you talk to Steve Barron, uh, and Steve Barron, if people aren't familiar with, is the director behind the Michael Jackson video, Billie Jean, which was a groundbreaking video. But you talk to all of these people and you really put a mosaic together on the startup of music video and how that transformed entertainment at that time. A lot of the people we talked about so far were men. Right. But I know there were a lot of women involved who were integral to the success of MTV from its very beginnings. Can you describe their role? Sure. Most, I would say most notably, uh, Judy McGrath, who went on to become, who ran MTV for a long while in the, I guess, in the, in the aughts. She started there. She wasn't a, quite an original employee, but uh, in November 81, she started as a copywriter. Uh, at MTV, she was kind of a music fan who read Rolling Stone and came from Pennsylvania and to New York to try to get a job in the music business and started MTV. And in and, and 2004, she was appointed the chairman CEO of MTV Networks. There was there were women, uh, you know, often there went, there's a woman named Gail Sparrow who played a really important role. She was the director of talent and art, artist relations from 81 to 85. You know, in the music world, often the pu- publicity is, has always been kind of considered a, a, a woman's job for, you know, it's not exactly the most progressive industry a lot of times. And, and often it was the women who were doing publicity at the record labels who then found homes at MTV doing promotion and artist relations and things like that. And then, of course, you know, it should be said that in front of the camera, you know, the VJs played an important role in, in establishing an identity of the network. And, you know, I would argue probably that at, at the very least, the most famous and beloved VJ from the first six or seven years of MTV was Martha Quinn. And, you know, maybe the second best known of the VJs was Nina Blackwood. So in front of the camera, too. And then, you know, after that, the next wave of VJs with uh, downtown Julie Brown, Tabitha Soren, who became very well associated with MTV News. So, you know, w- women for, for a a time and an industry where women were not afforded the same chances that men uh, had. MTV was moderately more progressive than other entertainment industries. Well, what you describe as a startup is a very key thing because anytime you're in a startup environment, that's opportunity for people that may not have the experience or the backgrounds. Right. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's some good stories in the book. There's a very well-known uh, media executive named Tom Preston. Uh, who went on to also run MTV, then w- had, and now has an ownership stake in Vice. You know, he, he's he's a he's a big wheeler dealer. He started off in, uh, as kind of the head of marketing at MTV. Uh, he was part of the original team. And he had never done anything in the record business. He he, he did import exports in for Afga- in Afghanistan, and just essentially walked in off the street and persuaded them to give him a job just because he was so jazzed to be uh, part of this kind of rock and roll outfit. So it was that type of place where, you know, it, certainly it helped if you had bona fides, but in some ways, you know, they didn't want people with a long resume. They wanted, you know, because this medium, this whole setup was so new, and and the idea of of airing these little three to four minute kind of uh, mini films for artists was such a a completely crazy scheme that it it, it wasn't it was impossible to attract the kind of people that they may have wanted to attract. And so they were almost had no choice but to extend opportunities to, you know, scrappy 24 year olds who were just willing to burn the midnight oil and, and just push as hard as possible. Well, let's talk about the idea itself and, and the environment, because we're, we're talking about cable television, which it's hard for people to believe maybe today, but back around the early 1980s, cable television was a new industry and growing. Cable was not found in just every household in the country. 
But cable was strongest in the Midwest, and that's very important for MTV because cable was more established in these Midwestern suburban communities, and that was their target demographic because that's who had cable. So that we had. And John Lack, as you mentioned, he was already working in the cable industry. He had responsibility for the movie channel and, and, a, and a children's channel that became Nickelodeon. Correct. And he was exploring music videos. And now we have a person that might be familiar to some people that know the Monkees, and that was Mike Nesmith. He was a member of the band called the Monkees back in the 1960s. And behind the scenes, Mike Nesmith probably was more successful. And he had this idea for a one-hour television show in the late 70s, early 80s. It featured comedians introducing music videos. So there were music videos out there. They just didn't have a platform just yet. So he wanted to create this platform for them, and he called it Pop Clips. It was a one-hour show. And that show seemed to be the catalyst for giving music videos the platform they needed. And you described that at length in your book. And you talked to Mike Nesmith. How did he describe the role he played in the transition from music videos being a novelty to music television? Well, you know, there are a lot of people who kind of, and, and he's one of them, and he has a he has a rightful claim on it that you know claim to have invented music videos or kind of come up for the idea for MTV you know prior to there being an MTV you know so so Nesmith actually made you know he made a music video in 1977 you know no no one ever saw it but it existed you know Todd Rundgren's another person who was an early you know. Uh, progenitor of the music video. He tried to launch a music video network before MTV. But, you know, having the idea for it isn't the same as executing the idea for it or starting it. You'd mentioned the state of cable back then. So, you know, it's it, it, it's famously known, but it's worth repeating that when MTV launched on August 1st, 1981, the, the, the MTV team, in order to actually watch the network go on the air, had to travel to Fort Lee, New Jersey, to a bar where they actually had cable television because they did because New York city, the, the had, had some cable television, but, the, but MTV wasn't aired in New York city and it wasn't aired in New York city for another year and, and changed. And it didn't air in LA for almost two years. So, you know, there, there's a very well-known story about John Sykes and Tom Preston, who we mentioned traveling to Tulsa, Oklahoma, a few months after MTV launched and Tulsa was one of the places that did carry MTV, because they they'd heard they'd gotten word that that bands like Duran Duran and Flock of Seagulls uh, and the Stray Cats, early kind of new wave bands who had made music videos, were selling records in a record store in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and they had figured out that there was no other reason why they might possibly be selling records there, if if except for MTV being on the air, because certainly no radio stations were playing those bands. Uh, no, no newspapers in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, were writing about them. So what they had was proof of concept when they went to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and they were able to go back to the record industry and say, "Look, you know, this works. We're selling records for you. You need to support us." So people like Nesmith, you know, there there are people who who were creative geniuses, but maybe didn't have the chops to be, or nor did they necessarily want to be programming executives. And it took a kind of discipline in order to both sell the concept of a music video network to a parent company that was going to fund it. And in the case of MTV, it was a weird, uh, it was originally funded by a weird company called Wasec, which was a combination of uh, Warner Communications, which was, which was a giant uh, t- television movie and, and uh, music company, and American Express, who were an investor in MTV. And they felt that w- the reason that they wanted to be in, in, in the music, in the cable business and in the uh, music channel business was their original thought was that cable was going to help them sell products into homes, not just by straight advertising, but by a two-way system where you, could, you would have this huge controller on your, on your coffee table a console that when, a, and if you subscribe to a cable network, when you were watching a commercial for, you know, a, a hairspray, you would push a button on this huge console and you'd order the hairspray. And it, this clearly never happened, but that was the thought. Um, and then you'd use your American Express to pay for this, all these services. You know, the one, one 
oft used cliche in the book that has you know relevance is it was the wild wild west. Um, this was true for the music video landscape, but also true for the cable landscape. And really, there were just a, you know a handful of players back then. Um, Ted Turner was probably the you know was probably the best known. He'd started CNN. He saw the benefits of cable television and the, and the promise of it. And he eventually tried to compete with MTV for a short-lived period. And that's the reason, uh, as explained in the book, why why the company that ran MTV uh, started VH1. The kind of a sister network was to kind of ward off the challenge of Ted Turner. So just to get back to your to your original question, yeah, people like Mike Nesmith in these very very early days did have kind of the idea for a music video network, but they really didn't have the the wherewithal to to get it off the ground. No, and that's where John Lack and his team came in and and their capabilities. And they came at this, as you mentioned earlier, with this radio sensibility. The, it was basically a radio station on video at first, where you had, and you had also described the VJs. So you took the format of a radio station. The format was AOR, album-oriented rock. So that was the pedigree that these executives came from, not just any radio background, but that type of radio background. And they brought that to video so they had the idea of a DJ, and they called it a VJ. And you mentioned some of the people, and these people became household faces. Nina Blackwood, Mark Goodman, J.J. Jackson, Martha Quinn, and Alan Hunter. Could you describe a little bit about how they put that group together and what they represented? Sure. It, 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 when, when trying to find the VJs, they, uh, the, the program executives process kind of wanted to have what was essentially like a boy band. You know, the cute one, pretty one, the handsome one. Uh, you know, I, I say this because this was the language that they used, the black one, in the case of J.J. Jackson. So, you know, they, they wanted a, a mix of people all, you know, from different backgrounds. Some were, were professional radio DJs who were, you know, who were telegenic. Martha, Martha Quinn was a, an intern at the local radio station in New York, and she was the last one hired. So it was a mix of people, you know, all music fans, obviously, and in a way, all it turned out eminently replaceable. The star of MTV was MTV itself. You know, I guess for a while one would have assumed that the star of MTV were the music videos. The, the VJs thought that they were the stars, but that turned out really not to be the case. And you know, and soon VJs were you know kind of being replaced almost you know on a, on a weekly basis. The music videos were clearly the star and the artists who made them. But at a certain point down the road, programming three-minute videos one after the other just did not prove to be a great television strategy. You know, people didn't know when, you know, when to tune in. There was no particular reason to watch it at 8 o'clock at night compared to 2 in the afternoon. The, the, the videos were the same. So they had to start coming up with more traditional television programming. Uh, they, you know, they would, at the very early days, they would group the videos together and have a countdown show. Then they, got, then they decided to have a game show, which was remote control. Eventually... Reality television came in, and that became the and still is the linchpin of MTV. So, what what came to be true is that you know MTV was endlessly just at always 14 years old, meaning it was always a teenager. You know, usually the demographic who watched MTV would eventually age out of it, and a new group of kids would come in and watch the network. So it was really the network itself that became the attraction, less the artists, the videos, and certainly less the VJs. So we talked about the VJs, but then there's the culture, and your book talks about that. The sex, the drugs, and the rock and roll. What was the atmosphere like at MTV off the air? Well, I think you very well accurately described it. You know, it was one thing to remember is that for the first, in the turning point, there were two turning points for MTV that, that paved their way to success. One was the I Want My MTV kind of commercial campaign that we mentioned earlier where artists came on the air to say, you know, call your cable operators and tell them that you want your, I want my MTV. And that was crucial because without getting distribution, without people all over the country being able to access MTV and have it carried on their cable system, there was just no, there was no road to success. That was crucial. The, the second most important part to MTV was the Michael Jackson thriller video, which I'm sure you, you know, you were going to get to, but yeah. I'll, I'll answer your question. Um, you know, MTV was programmed like a white rock radio station. The idea of playing 
uh, a black artist and a, a pop song or a R&B song was just it, it it they rejected that idea. They just thought that from their experience in radio, they had to play only one particular kind of music for one and that their their demographic would only want one particular kind of music. Michael Jackson came along with this blockbuster album with a wonderful song and an incredibly sophisticated video for Billie Jean. And the, his label, CBS Records, put up a fierce fight that t- with MTV and said, you have to play this video or we will boycott. We will pull all our other videos. CBS was, a very, was the number one or two label at the time, had a lot of big artists. And there are uh, disputing accounts of what happened the MTV people still to this day, Bob Pittman, et cetera, claim that, that they were never threatened and they were always going to play the video, Billie Jean, that is. The Columbia CBS executives claim otherwise, said that they had to essentially blackmail MTV in order to, for them to play and air the Michael Jackson video. For wh- whoever you believe, the f- eventually Billie Jean got aired and then became a huge sensation and then beat it aired after that, and then, of course, Thriller aired after that. So that's a long answer to your question, what was it like at MTV? For the first two years there, and remember, people started there a year or so before the network even went on the air, for the first two years, it was very hand-to-mouth. You know, no one, no one knew whether this was going to survive. It was close to going out of business, having the funding pulled from it. So the atmosphere back then, prior to Thriller, was while people were still doing tons of blow and having sex in the corridors and uh, you know having a great deal of fun it was the energy was really manic because they were never sure if this thing was going to get the plug pulled at any moment once thriller hit and MTV became you know this kind of intense money machine that was a ratings blockbuster and had enormous cultural cachet. It changed a little bit because it needed to get a little bit more buttoned down. You know, they needed to then, you know, appeal to a slightly more white collar advertiser. They needed, you know, their their reputation became that of, you know, now we're not just a scrappy startup. We're we're television executives and we need to occasionally look and act and dress the part. So, while there are still, you know, plenty of fun to be had, I think it's those first few years where things were teetering on the edge all the time that the people who worked there really looked most fondly back on. You talk about the Billie Jean video when it happened, and it's almost like there are bookends. There's the startup period, and then there's the Billie Jean video, which almost brought MTV to a legitimate level. And in between, there were those music videos, the ones that kind of defined MTV as a programming vehicle. And somebody in your book described it as another British invasion, that when all of these bands started to appear on MTV, they weren't typically American bands, and they may not have made it on American radio, so they wouldn't have made it without MTV. The Police with Sting. Obviously, Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones were already successful, and so was David Bowie. But you also had these bands like Duran Duran, Men at Work, Tears for Fears, these types of bands that became popular because of MTV, what artistic impact did MTV have on the music industry during those first years? Right. So the, the launch of MTV coincided with the popularity of kind of new wave and what was called new romantic music in England, which kind of music that came after the punk era was dominated by synthesizers and, and synthesized drums and by very theatrical artists, artists like Duran Duran and the Human League and Soft Cell, mention a flock of seagulls, uh, then Depeche Mode, groups like that, The Cure, um, a little later. These were artists who were very theatrical, who paid a lot of attention to the, what they wore. Um, Culture Club is, a, is another uh, really important example. So their look was as important as their sound. And their sound was great, and their look was fantastic. And that all coupled with them enjoying the challenge and uh, of making music videos, of being, of making these little mini films, uh, and of, of making them not just of them performing in a kind of more straightforward way, but of creating these, these scenarios, these tableaus, these characters that you know weren't always linear. 
right? So, you know, uh, you would watch a music video by, by Duran Duran, Hungry Like the Wolf, and, you know, they were, you kind of, there was just a lot of symbolism and weirdness to it, and you really, you know, they weren't telling a story that went from A to B. We're going to need some vocal mic up loud. Oh, oh turn it up. Thanks. That should be good. as kind of metaphorical as some of the music lyrics themselves. Yes, this is Dean Grillo from Cablevision magazine. This is a question for uh, Peter Townsend. Given your desire to see more depth on TV and other cable television shows, how do you uh, make those video appearances more touchable and reachable? Well, I think it's a really interesting question and I'm just not really enough time to go into it in any depth but I mean I I just feel it's it's a new potential art form I I just don't think that at the moment it's one of these things that that, that tends to happen a lot in this day and age uh, the, the technological advances are, 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 are outstripping the 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 artists ability to, to keep up uh, we're just getting to grips with uh, with with the the phonograph record when 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 video comes along, and uh, I think it's just another challenge to the creative mind and to the artist and to the performer. The American bands that were super popular at the day, like Styx, let's say, or Journey, you know, these bands had had no idea how to make a music video, and they were you know they had to make them with a gun held to their head. So. It's very. It's important to recognize that in the very early days of MTV, there were only when MTV first signed on the air, there were maybe 250 music videos that existed in the whole world. You know, it was not a popular art form or a commercial form. So MTV had to play a lot of stuff that they didn't really have much of a choice. When they when these other groups came along, the the groups we just mentioned, with these really great looking mini films, MTV embrace them even if those bands were obscure and weird looking and had no american fan base you know music television was a visual medium not just an audio medium and they aired these videos and, and played the living sh crap out of them um, and they created stars out of these groups who i think otherwise would never have gotten the support in america that they they got and you know some of these groups can still play you know arenas and i think and then later on in MTV's evolution, the same became true for hair metal, for bands like Poison and Guns N' Roses and Motley Crue and Bon Jovi, most famously probably. These kind of hammy, pretty male, you know, uh, rock stars became so closely associated with music videos and MTV that, and MTV was such such a monolithic force back then that a lot of these groups are are, uh, are still incredibly famous now because of the really because of the airplane exposure they got from MTV in this window of the 80s. So, you know, because it was a visual medium, MTV wanted flamboyant, great-looking people on their on their channel. And they took what they could get. And in those days, it was new wave music and then later hair metal. And then there were the American bands that took followed the lead of some of these British bands, not just bands either, individuals. Uh, two that come to mind... One was an established American band by the name of ZZ Top. They had a famous video. And Cyndi Lauper, who was an upstart, she was made by MTV. Could you describe what ZZ Top and Cyndi Lauper learned? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I think Cyndi Lauper is a natural for, you know, uh, for music videos. And, and obviously, the most, you know, I should, we haven't mentioned her name yet, but the most famous kind of quote-unquote creation of MTV is Madonna. You know, people, people said that the M in MTV stood for Madonna. Madonna probably said that herself. And Madonna was the perfect MTV artist, the perfect merging of visuals and personality and sex appeal. You know, I think Cyndi Lauper would have been a nat was a natural for MTV, you know, both like the sound of her music which was had you know was both pop and rock and the kind of, you know, her colorful, you know, almost wacky stage persona you know, from her hair to the way she spoke to her clothing it was just, you know, tailor-made for, for a television set. ZZ Topper are, are an even weirder example since they were this 
you know, this three-piece blues band from Texas who were who no one would have ever expected to become MTV stars. But they a they had a look, which they milked, and b then they they changed their sound in order to adapt to a more '80s, almost new wave sound with with a kind of programmed drums, and and c and something that really shouldn't be left unsaid with a lot of the groups we're talking about. They put a lot of pretty girls in their video. They were not uh, above. In fact, they were they were kind of part and parcel of, of putting a lot of eye candy, you know, in in their music videos. And while that I think had a short shelf life, thankfully, but for bands like ZZ Top and Van Halen and and then but even still today, you know, uh, pretty girls uh, either dancing or as kind of plot lines or background for your music video was a a fairly straightforward way to appeal to the MTV audience. And ZZ Top very strategically milked that to to put out by far the biggest songs of their career. Well, what you just described says everything about their demographics because at that time, I believe their target demographic was a young male, late teens, early 20s. That's who they were going after, so that's what they thought young men wanted to see. And I guess due to their success, they were probably right. Yeah, I would say they were probably right. <laughs> well, you had mentioned the, the M&Ms, and, and we definitely could not talk about MTV and its early success without talking about Michael Jackson and Madonna. And first, I wanted to talk about Michael Jackson. You kind of got into s- some detail with Michael Jackson. The big question for a long time was, is there a market for Michael Jackson? In other words, do these suburban white males want to watch Michael Jackson. Uh, they were, you talked about a concept called narrow casting, which is a radio term, which is you play a narrow band of music to appeal to the demographic you want. So if you want suburban white guys back in the early 1980s, and these are most cable subscribers back then, then you had to, you had to go by your assumptions, and their assumptions were obviously wrong. But they assumed based on their AOR background, that Michael Jackson wasn't going to have that appeal to them. And here's what I remember you saying, and I wanted to ask you to elaborate on it. You said that the package is more than just the sound of the record or the even the skin color of the artist, that what they learned, what MTV learned when Michael Jackson became successful was that it was more than just the sound of the music or even the genre of the music, that it was also about the package. Well, I think what they also learned was that was that MTV was so powerful that it didn't need to ascribe to these kind of smaller standards or, or rules that radio had set up. That MTV, just by the, the sheer force of its, of, it, of, of its cultural dominance, could air Michael Jackson videos and erase the assumptions that they'd operated under. You know, it, so... It's kind of a, it's kind of I think that's what most surprised the you know Bob Pittman and the executives was that you know that they didn't have to operate under these old rules because they were just so big that they can make their they can make their own rules. So you know so of course with Michael Jackson you know it's not quite fair to say that MTV created him because you know the off the wall record which came out in '79 was you know sold millions and millions of copies. He was a massive superstar prior to MTV existing. And, and, and then Thriller came out, and it was, you know, even exponentially bigger than Off the Wall. And so MTV would have had to be essentially actively racist, which they were prepared to do, to ignore the, the star power of Michael Jackson. And Michael Jackson was also smart enough to make, not everyone knew how or cared to make high-end, really interesting visual art back then. You know, and and Michael Jackson wanted to entrusted in the case of Beat It, Steve Barron, and in the case of Thriller, John Landis, the the wherewithal uh, and the and the freedom to make these great music videos, these great short films. I mean, Thriller when it came out got you know premiered at movie theaters in L.A. like a like a you know like a real legitimate uh, cinematic masterpiece. So. You know, it, it. I mean, Michael Jackson was, you know, and now is for other reasons. Is it was a very unique and sui generis artist. You know, it, he broke the template, uh, the, and and luckily, you know, opened the door for a lot of other artists at MTV. You know, someone like Prince also made, you know, was another important person who, whose earlier videos did not get on the air, but then who started to make more just better looking videos, slightly more uh, conceptual videos. 
and and then also became like a mainstay, obviously, of MTV. So sometimes artists had to had to up their game back in the day and and create uh, better looking films. And then so, and then of course MTV had to lose their their racially biased radio programming tendencies and embrace you know kind of a new a new vision of star power. Well, that was Michael Jackson. The other M in the M and M's was Madonna, who you mentioned, and I liked how you described this. You said that she's the one who understood that video could be used for provocation and exhibitionism. She teamed with director Mary Lambert for her videos, and her videos were known for burning crosses, interracial kisses, gay kisses, wedding dresses, S&M, zoo animals, all types of things. Basically, she pushed the boundaries and created controversy, and in the process, she created buzz. Her appearance, you describe, and this is another quote from you, her appearance at the first music video awards in 1984 was the award show equivalent of Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, the ideal against which all successors would be measured. So she was definitely one who, she wasn't like Michael Jackson. She wasn't famous before MTV. So MTV made her, but she in turn made MTV. How did she do that? Well, she did it by putting out a steady stream of, you know, brilliant videos for, you know, probably, I mean, uh, almost up until today, but certainly, you know, for the first 10 to 15 years of MTV, she was its most important artist. She was very visually uh, acute. You know, she was, she, A, she was always reinventing her sound and her look. And so, it, you know, it, that's really important because you, you just, if you're a music fan, even a casual one, you don't want to just kind of watch the same video. You don't want to watch an artist make the same video over and over and over again. You, you need there to be, you know, constant reinvention. And that came very naturally to her. So there was, there was always a reason to tune into the new Madonna video because you, just, you were never sure what she was going to bring. And she she was um, she was gorgeous. She knew she was gorgeous. She worked with great filmmakers. She was you know she was a, a very creative kind of New Yorker who appreciated filmmaking. And and she was surrounded by smart people. Her record company gave her the money that you know she she wanted and needed to create these these films. And MTV, the executives there, they knew what they had in her. They let her do whatever she wanted. Uh, almost, you know, at least up to Justify My Love, which they had, they, they, they stupidly wouldn't play when she, you know, kind of bit the hand that fed her. My definition of new music is something that's, you know, fresh and reflecting of, you know, the, the times, the, the, the politics, the fashion, the energy, something new, you know, something that, that uh, that's applicable to what's happening in the world today. You know, I, I, I think Michael Jackson first and Madonna second were the the A and B of MTV's early success. And they took us to 1986, and 1986 became a big year for MTV. That's when the original VJs started to leave and new ones were hired. You mentioned earlier that the next wave was hair metal, so you started to have an edgier type of video, a little bit different tone, probably the same audience, but just a, a different approach to it. You said that ideas were running out, ratings started to go down, and at that point, even though they they had fallen back on an AOR sensibility when they programmed it, they started to introduce rap music in the late 1980s to broaden their demographics. Yeah, sure. Well, as they were initially reluctant to play black artists like Michael Jackson, they were very initially reluctant to air hip hop videos. And it took, you know, they it, it took the show UMTV Raps and the creator of that show to say you know, say, okay, we'll 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 do it. We'll play them at two in the morning and we'll we'll see how it goes. And luckily, the ratings were through the roof. And so, of course, MTV, which is nothing if not you know greedy money making. A TV company, when they saw that the audience was there, they went full hog for it and gave UMTV Raps, uh, you know, uh, a much better time spot. So, it, it, you know, MTV, they're, they're businessmen. They're not, and if, if something works, they'll they'll play it to death. And if something doesn't work, they'll ne you'll never see it, you know, again. So it, it took a little convincing, but UMTV Raps was a, you know, not just an incredibly significant show for for. MTV, but was 
massively important for putting rap music into into the households of you know of suburban America. MTV helped with hip hop's emergence as a uh, a little bit more of a mainstream music genre. And that's when videos started to take a back seat. And the two, the two big elements that you talk about in your book before we get to 1992 that kind of changed MTV and maybe changed pop culture were the spring break telecasts and then the introduction of reality TV, their own program called The Real World. Well, I don't know if, I don't know if spring break helped the network evolve or devolve. Um, <laughs> you know, spring break culture was obviously already existed. MTV was kind of plopped down in the middle of it and uh, exploited it to to the maximum degree. You know, I mean, it's weird if you go back and, and you can you can watch Jon Stewart, former future host of The Daily Show, who got a start on MTV. Uh, you can watch him hosting spots from, from MTV Spring Break in either Florida or Arizona, and it's, it's, quite, a, it's quite a jarring juxtaposition to watch Jon Stewart uh, introducing I can't remember who, but some one hit wonder while, you know, the cameraman caught girls jiggling in the, in the crowd. So the, now the real world is a whole other, uh, you know, kettle of fish. That was, you know, perhaps one of the 10 most important shows in television history. It certainly changed MTV's fortunes and, and changed its programming, but it, but likewise, or, and probably more importantly, it changed the, it changed the history of television by introducing a successful reality television based programming to, to uh, cable and and then network television. What's the legacy of that show? Uh, every every cable network on television now, from you know Bravo to uh, you know HGTV, you know to The Bachelor, to Survivor. The, you know the the legacy is is in, in that is the death of scripted, or at least you know obviously there's plenty of scripted television, but the demise of scripted television and the rise of reality based television. You know, it's it's a it's a it's, someone would have tried it sooner or later, clearly. And I think MTV now is bring is brought back the real world, and it's viewable on Facebook just to show how the world has changed. But certainly, it I think from from the perspective of of music videos, we make the case in the book, and I think it's more or less true that it made music videos less important to the culture. You know, it, now of course, when one wants to watch a music video, you go on you go on your laptop or your phone, and you you know probably just type in the name of the band that you want to see, and you watch your video on YouTube. Then you you know the video. So that's a that's a kind of active uh, response. You, you search for something. Back then, it was kind of passive. You would turn on MTV, and whatever videos MTV wanted to play, you would have to watch. There was really there was you had no choice if you wanted to see music videos. You just had to wait for them to appear and hope that MTV would air them. Once MTV found success with the real world, they no music videos were no longer the primary focus of their programming. It took a little while, of course, and there's still plenty of great music videos that came out in the 90s and and the aughts and still today. But that that kind of water cooler moment where people would tune into MTV all at the same time. You know, when they knew that the new world premiere of the R.E.M. video would come on the air at 8 o'clock on a Thursday, once the real world hit, th- that was, that was, it, was, it was the beginning of the end for that kind of signature music video moment. Well, music videos faded, and then reality TV and other programming took its place. But there is something that you said never changed at MTV. You said that the demographics are the same today, as they were then. In fact, in your words, MTV's demographic never changes, even though everyone at MTV ages. So how would you describe MTV today and, and what it has ahead of it? Well, it's, it's scraping the bottom right now. I mean, I, I don't, it gives me no pleasure and it's certainly not an original thought. They, 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 seeded, they seeded the youth market. They, you know, what, what they had was that they were the number one Kind of not just network, but in some ways the number one cultural arbiter of the for and of the youth market. And then you know lots of things happened to make that not true anymore. The internet happened, you know, uh, YouTube happened, streaming happened, just so many things happened for lots of reasons. Viacom, the company that owns MTV, could not quite keep up MTV's place as something that directly reflects youth culture. You know, they. I think I would say though. You know, their last hit show. I mean, you know, Jersey Shore or The Hills, maybe. 
Teen Mom. But you know, when when Teen Mom becomes your signature show compared to Madonna videos, I think that says a lot about where the, the value of your network or of your brand. So they uh, so they've lost their place. You know, I think right now their programming mainly consists of trying to refresh hit shows from the past three to ten years: Jersey Shore, Teen Mom, The Hills. They they can't seem to figure out who or what they want to be or who or what their audience wants them to be if they have an audience. You know, they try to. Uh, I guess their last musical hit was really was the show TRL Total Request Live, which was a great show that really you know helped the fortunes of a lot of the artists, mainly you know teen pop and boy band artists. And a few a couple of years ago, they tried to relaunch that and it failed spectacularly. So. You know, it's 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 not what it was. That's that's for damn sure. You know, I think I think I think you know Bob Pittman said something, or and David Geffen in the book says something to Bob Pittman when Bob Pittman is considering leaving MTV after trying to buy the company and failing. And David Geffen said you, you should leave MTV because you don't want to be known as just the guy who had this one idea. And I've always been taken with that statement because a it it, it shows a certain uh, level of of moxie that only you know real titans of of industry could ever that uh, could ever be dissatisfied with with just creating MTV because you know M- MTV is just such a incredibly impactful company and and brand and musical and cultural force. We didn't even talk about the influence it had on television, on film, on uh, on fashion. On, on advertising, you know, directors, people don't know, but m- probably the two most influential music, um, film directors of the last 15 years, David Fincher and Michael Bay, both got their starts making music videos. They even worked for the same company that, that made music videos. So MTV's, you know, legacy, and we, and we also didn't talk about the, the incredible graphics and uh, that MTV used for their logo and other things, the, the interstitials, the that they did to promote their own network were you know, blindingly ahead of their time. So it's rare that something that's that creative is also so commercial at the same time. That was, you know, the kind of the, the quicksilver genius of, of MTV. Craig Marks, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. To learn more about Craig Marks and the book he wrote with Rob Tannenbaum called I Want My MTV, The Uncensored Story of the Music Video Revolution, please see our show notes at shapingopinion.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please let people know by leaving a rating and review in Apple Podcasts. You can subscribe to the Shaping Opinion Podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcast. We'd love to hear from you. On Twitter, just tweet to us at Shaping Opinion. Or you can get in touch with us through our website, shapingopinion.com. We have a Facebook page and we're on Instagram at Shaping Opinion. Shaping Opinion is a production of O'Brien Communications. This is where we talk about people, events, and things that have shaped the way we think. Until next time, I'm Tim O'Brien.